you find yourself somewhere deep in a mystical forest. It's dark and filled with plants and trees the likes you have never seen before. The forest doesn't seem like a regular one, almost like a maze, even a labyrinth. You are on a quest searching for an enchanted castle that is said to contain priceless treasures. But to get there means going through this mysterious forest. As you pass by the towering trees and shimmering streams, you find yourself face to face with two different paths. One looks long, flat, but dimly lit due to the lack of sunshine coming through. The other looks a bit more treacherous, but appears to be much more visible. Which path will you take? How do you make the right decision to continue on your quest? Will your choice steer you toward your destiny, or will you be diverted with no hope of survival? I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dress, consumed, and connected. And today, it's a look back on the book series that took the world by storm and captured a new generation of readers. This is the story of the Choose Your Own Adventure books. The Choose Your Own Adventure books were a series of books that had multiple endings based on the choices the reader made throughout the story. They reached their popularity in the 80s, selling millions of copies. But to start our own story today, we need to begin with the creator of these books. Edward Packard was born in 1931 in Huntington, New York. He attended Princeton before serving in the U.S. Navy. Packard also graduated from Columbia University and spent time working as a lawyer. But Packard always had a love of writing and would eventually move into that as a full-time career. Today, Edward Packard is 92 years old and to say he is still as sharp as a tack is a massive understatement. To this day, he continues to write books, runs a website, and even blogs daily. And I've been very fortunate to connect with him via email. So there will be a few insights sprinkled throughout this episode coming from the man himself. So how did the Choose Your Own Adventure books come to be? Well, it all begins with a bedtime story. Mr. Packard told me that he grew up with a love of adventure books like Treasure Island and Robinson Crusoe, and he used these as an influence to create some bedtime stories for his children. One of the first he came up with included a place he named Sugarcane Island. In his message to me, Mr. Packard says that keeping the story going meant, quote, asking my kids what would they do in the situations in the story. This led to getting different answers, which led to multiple plot lines, unquote. Thanks to his kids, the stories could organically go in various directions, and the stories could change every night, keeping them fresh and his kids engaged. What made them unique is that his kids got to be part of the story. If his kids enjoyed these interactive stories where the outcome always changed, would others? Mr. Packard told me that as soon as he had thought of this idea for these stories at bedtime, he quickly thought of a book that worked the same way. Packard began putting something together and figuring out the logistics of a book with multiple plots and therefore multiple endings. He used hand-drawn flowcharts to map out the story. He envisioned a tree with the trunk being the core of the story and the branches being all the different options that could emerge from the core story. The story would progress for a certain amount of pages and end on a cliffhanger that gave you the option to continue the story along with the page number to turn to to continue on that specific path. Or you could choose to take the story in a different direction and turn to that specific page. Some deviations could end up in the same place, but 
it was a complicated process of tying together the various directions and including several endings for each one. We're now in the 1970s, and eventually Packard got the unique story put together and called it The Adventures of You on Sugarcane Island. He connected with an agent to start shopping it around. The agent was able to get Packard's story in front of some major publishers, and they all turned it down. Some publishers said that it was more like a game than a book. It just wouldn't be a viable idea. Packard figured his unique book was a dead end and put the story into his desk, not returning to it for years. In 1976, he decided to give it another shot. While on a skiing trip in Vermont, he came across a small publisher named Vermont Crossroads Press. They were looking for new and innovative children's books. Talk about a match made in heaven. Run by R.A. Montgomery, VCP was the perfect publisher to launch the book, which was not yet called Choose Your Own Adventure, but still went by the original title, Sugar Cane Island. Vermont Crossroads Press was a small publishing house, but Montgomery was a smart marketer, even doing hands-on market research by going to local schools to gauge the kids' interest in this new book. The kids, just like Packard's own children, love the interactive story. There's just something about feeling involved, and this story gave it to these kids. But since VCP was so small, distribution and exposure would be limited. Packard then worked with Lippincott, a bigger publisher, to release his next two books. But Montgomery would still play a major role in Packard's success. Even though he would eventually move on from them, Lippincott provided the biggest contribution by giving Packard's stories the name Choose Your Own Adventure. While all this was going on, R.A. Montgomery was still putting in the legwork for Packard and the books, which led him to a bigger publisher named Bantam Books. Owned by Random House, this was what Packard had been waiting for, a major publisher that had a huge distribution. He told me that despite having his first few stories published by the smaller publishers, it took Bantam's marketing clout to get them widely popular. Bantam really believed in these unique books and put all their marketing muscle behind them. The first Choose Your Own Adventure story published by Bantam Books is the one that most people are familiar with when they think of these iconic stories. And that is Choose Your Own Adventure number one, the Cave of Time. Released in 1979 and written by Packard, The Cave of Time followed the format he created where the book is written from a first-person point of view. You are the character. And in The Cave of Time, you find yourself in Snake Canyon, lost in the mystical Cave of Time. In the cave, you find different tunnels. If you take one, will you end up in the past? Take another, and you may find yourself in the future. The different possibilities in the cave of time could cause you to run into a T-Rex or encounter an alien spacecraft. The cave of time is a landmark book as it kicked off this whole new era where we got to choose our own adventures. The book was marketed as having 40 possible endings, and it's the book that many kids would first discover in the 1980s. The Cave of Time was quickly followed by Journey Under the Sea. And as we enter the 80s, the books really start to take off. Five more stories were released in 1980, which included Space and Beyond, The Mystery of Chimney Rock, Your Codename is Jonah, The Third Planet from Altair, and one of my all-time favorites, Deadwood City. In 1981, three new books were also released, two actually written by R.A. Montgomery. And this is the year things really start to take off. Choose Your Own Adventure was about to become bigger than anyone could ever imagine. Everything 80s will return after these messages.
Not only were the Choose Your Own Adventure books a unique storytelling format, they also had a physical advantage compared to other children's books. They were smaller, soft covers. Most kids' books were bigger and hard-covered. The Choose Your Own Adventure books were in the smaller adult size format. This was smart for a few reasons. One was that the smaller form factor allowed the Choose Your Own Adventure books to have their own racks in bookstores. Those racks contained several of the different titles. The other was the smaller size made them more appealing to older kids. A 13 or 14 year old probably doesn't want to carry around a giant copy of Goodnight Moon. But The Cave of Time looked like a grown-up novel. The books were still intended for younger readers, but some of the stories could get a little intense and might not appeal to those who were very young. Bantam addressed this by creating Choose Your Own Adventure for Younger Readers. These books followed less intense themes and began in 1981 with The Curse and The Haunted House. Now, Bantam had a much wider age demographic to buy their books. Bantam Books also went straight to their core audience by sending the books out to teachers. The books were quickly gaining in popularity and selling like hotcakes. By 1981, 4 million copies of the books were in print. 8 of the 11 Choose Your Own Adventure titles were in the top 25 juvenile bestsellers. And the series ranked 6 in popularity for all kids books published in 1980 and 1981. The rapid success led to a moment that helped take the books to the next level. Mr. Packer told me that one of the big signs that he had made it and that the books were a huge hit was when he got a full-page write-up in the New York Times. In that article from August 25th, 1981, Packard got to tell the origins of the incredibly popular books. He shared how the story can constantly change, and he explained how you are the main character. The article informed readers that the books were so popular that in some classrooms, the same book was being read by multiple kids, each bookmarking their own place in the story. The New York Times article also shared how the Choose Your Own Adventure books were now considered a key part of care packages for summer camps. The success of the books and the New York Times article led to the other moment that Mr. Packard told me was the ultimate sign he had made it, an appearance on the Today Show. This was a huge deal, and he told me how back then, it was the biggest morning TV show out there. Edward Packard had truly arrived. Now, thanks to the extra exposure, the Choose Your Own Adventure books are more popular than ever. In 1982, another five titles were released, including The Forbidden Castle and the book that a few years later I would keep in my desk in the third grade to sneakily try to read during class, Inside UFO 5440. So what is it exactly that made the Choose Your Own Adventure book so unique? Yes, having 40 different endings was unlike anything we had really ever seen before, but it goes a lot deeper than that. It was true, innovative storytelling. As a young third grader, I was unaware of the linear narrative structure of traditional books. On some level, I was aware that stories followed a certain path, but Choose Your Own Adventure turned all that on its head. Now, and for the first time for many of us, we had to think of storytelling in a new way. We had to become active participants in them. These books were engaging in every sense of the word. Choose Your Own Adventure challenged our decision-making skills and the outcomes of our decisions. These books gave you a feeling of responsibility in that the choices you made mattered. That's a unique thing for a little kid who generally doesn't get to experience that feeling of ownership. The Choose Your Own Adventure books really were a unique departure from what we were used to reading. To me, they always felt like a real-life video game in that there was a different outcome every time. 
When I read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I knew exactly where it was going. With Prisoner of the Ant People, the story could be different every time, and it created a freshness and sense of excitement each time you picked it up. Owning one book felt like owning several. These books are also unique because they exposed us to several genres of books. Through the releases in the 1980s, just some of the genres we experienced through Choose Your Own Adventure included science fiction, mystery, fantasy, thriller, horror, and history. From The Outlaws of Sherwood Forest from 1985, House of Danger released in 1982, and Secret of the Pyramids from 1983, the series exposed us to genres we may not have ever experienced at the time. This unique storytelling style had a few other benefits. Not only did they expand our imaginations, they had an educational component to them too. These were books that fit comfortably in the classroom. They were entertaining, but again, exposed us to themes and genres that may coincide with what we were learning at school. The Choose Your Own Adventure books are what helped me really get into medieval history and then a whole new world of books such as King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Education-wise, the Choose Your Own Adventure books also helped us with critical thinking and problem solving. Going into 1983, demand for new titles went through the roof. In 1983 alone, 11 new books were released, including titles like Space Patrol, Lost in the Amazon, and Secret of the Pyramids. So was Packard actually having to write at such a prolific rate? He told me that Bantam wanted to release one book a month, but he could only write one every two to three months. So other writers were brought in to write the other books. In 1984, Bantam kept that one release a month schedule with 12 new books put out that year. Some of those titles included Journey to Stonehenge, Supercomputer, and The Dragon's Den. The monthly release schedule continued for all of 1985, 86, 87, and 1988. In 1989, they still managed to release 10 titles. And as those were being released, the Choose Your Own Adventure for Younger Readers books were still going strong. Anywhere from three to eight books were released each year in the 80s. Some of those titles include The Space Monster, The Bigfoot Mystery, and The Mummy's Tomb. In the 1980s alone, between the main series and the younger editions, nearly 150 different Choose Your Own Adventure books were released. But they didn't stop there, with another 90 being released in the 90s. Throughout the entire run, Edward Packard continued to write some of the books. Over the course of 236 titles, Packard wrote nearly 60 of them. I was always curious if he had a favorite among all those books, and he told me that it's hard to say, but Hyperspace was probably his favorite, mainly because he included himself as one of the characters in it. As the 80s became the 90s, the Choose Your Own Adventure books were one of the most popular children's series in both decades. Between 1979 and 1998, more than 250 million copies of these books were sold. We all have those specific things from our past, like movies, songs, and in this case, books that trigger instant feelings of nostalgia. For many, the Choose Your Own Adventure books are one of those physical items that transport us back in time. If you ever see one at a garage sale or discover a beat up copy in a box of your old things, they bring back instant memories. Even just seeing the Choose Your Own Adventure cover title can do that. And speaking of that, Stranger Things has been one of the biggest streaming hits of our time and serves as a love letter to the 1980s. Back in 2016, when that opening music hit and we first saw the Stranger Things title appear in the opening credits, it may have seemed somewhat familiar to you if you grew up in the 80s. The Stranger Things title is written in the ITC Bengat font, the exact same font used on the cover 
of the Choose Your Own Adventure books. For many, even if we weren't exactly sure why at first, Stranger Things had an instant feeling of familiarity because of the covers of the books we grew up on. You can also see this font used on many Stephen King books, and even on the cover of the Smiths album, Strange Ways, Here We Come, from 1987. Even though it was invented in the 70s, ITC Bengat can be considered the font of the 1980s. The Choose Your Own Adventure books left a major impression on a generation of kids. They really helped to open up our imaginations and how reading can transport us to new worlds and adventures. I mentioned earlier that these books felt like real-life video games, and I really think Choose Your Own Adventure primed kids who would become big fans of games like The Legend of Zelda. Role-playing games like these weren't mindless shooting or action, but had deep storytelling, decision-making, and actual engagement. In the 1980s, The Legend of Zelda and Zelda II The Adventure of Link sold over 10 million units, and according to video game charts, these two games represented nearly 22% of the total games sold in the top 10. Were the choose-your-own-adventure books the catalyst for their success? It's hard to tell, but kids in the 80s were being exposed to very engaging and interactive content compared to other generations. But I would say that Choose Your Own Adventure did seem to influence Nintendo in some way. This is a deep cut, but in 1986, you may remember The Legend of Zelda, The Mirage Castle. Released in Japan, this Choose Your Own Adventure style book came out not long after The Legend of Zelda game was first released. You may also remember that going into the 90s, Nintendo released Nintendo Adventure Books. These were a 12-book series based on Zelda and Mario that also followed the Choose Your Own Adventure format. The Choose Your Own Adventure books helped us to consider choices and make decisions. You gripped your fingers between the different sections so you could see how the story played out and see where your choices led you. For kids who had little say in daily decisions, these books gave you that responsibility. The thing I like best is these books made me forget I was reading, and for me, they opened up a whole new world of literature. I slowly graduated to C.S. Lewis and the Narnia books, then Tolkien, The Hobbit, and Lord of the Rings. The Choose Your Own Adventure books were the bridge to discovering all these classic works. Depending on your age, that may have been the experience for you too. Or maybe they just help you rediscover your love of reading. And as we finish up, I have to say how surreal it is to have been able to communicate with Edward Packard. It's like a full circle moment to connect with the person that created these incredible books that were such a big part of my life when I was a little kid. I used to read these books when I was supposed to be sleeping, so it feels so remarkable to have been able to communicate with him in this modern digital way that was unimaginable back in the early 80s. To tell me back then that in the year 2023, I would get a digital message from the creator of the books I loved beamed through satellites to a computer I can carry in my pocket would seem like something out of science fiction, almost like something that could have existed perfectly in those very books. And as we finish, there's one other unique connection to this whole story. If you grew up in the 80s, there's a good chance you remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books. You may have also embraced a new era of Superman. Kids in the 80s were discovering a new decade of Superman comics and more Superman content than ever before. Many were discovering the original movie for the very first time, along with all the new 1980s offerings like Superman 2, Superman 3, Supergirl, and Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. 
Superman content and movies obviously continue to this day. And as of the time of this recording, James Gunn has cast David Cornsweet to play Superman in the upcoming movie, Superman Legacy. And Cornsweet is the grandson of Edward Packard. So I want to thank you so much for listening. Your quest is at an end. If you enjoyed this show, there's plenty more where that came from. So be sure to check out my previous episodes for more 1980s content. And to make sure you don't miss out on new episodes, be sure to subscribe to the Everything 80s podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're in a position to help support the show, you can consider becoming a part of patreon.com. That's the platform to get access to bonus 1980s content, including the Everything 80s Movie Review Podcast, where I review the good, the bad, and the ugly of 1980s movies. One of the newest that's just been released there, the 1986 coming-of-age classic, Stand By Me. So thank you for being here with me today. I know there are a ton of podcasts out there, so the fact you're spending your time here listening to mine is an amazing thing. So that's it for me. I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it. <laughs>